Hello everyone and welcome to July 2021 Talking Team webinar. My name is Nilu Parvinashtiani and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. This, this webinar is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and hosted by the National Operation Center of Excellence, also known as NOCLO. Um, so we at NOCLO are very grateful of the Federal Highway team who help organize uh, the Talking Team webinar series. Um, so before we start, um, just as a quick reminder, if you wanted to uh, get to know uh, more about NOCO and its resources, you can use the links that is in the NOCO useful links. Um, you can also um, reach uh, to links related to this webinar on the Talking Team Web links window that you see on your screen, as well as um, a PDF of today's presentation in the download pod. This page is available now at the intro and then again at the end uh, for uh, the Q&A session. Um, the other logistical items that I wanted to mention is that we're recording the webinar and that recording along with the presentations will also be available on the on-demand learning session, section of the NOCO website. Um, as a heads up, we are using the Mentimeter tool during the um, one part of the presentation at this webinar, so please be prepared to follow instructions that will be posted in the question discussion pod to uh, open those links in your browser and interact with us. Um, all the phones for attendees are on listen-only mode by default, but please use the discussion uh, question pod just like you are doing now for any comments and questions uh, during the webinar. Um, we have a dedicated time at the end for Q&A session. So uh, as questions come to your mind, please just type them at that chat pod. And uh, at the end, uh, we'll go ahead and cover those questions. So that's all I had with the logistics. And uh, I'll hand it over to our moderator, Paul Jordan, to start us off. Paul. Thank you, Nilu. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. On behalf of uh, Federal Highway, Jim Ostridge, Joe Tebow, and myself, we want to thank, uh, thanks again, big thanks again to Nilu uh, and the National Operations Center of Excellence for working in partnership with us on this. So, um, you know, and greetings uh, um, to all the Tim champions that are participating today. Just as a, a quick Heads up there, um, we will be do asking you to uh, log in. Uh, you'll see in the chat pod from Vaishali Shah, uh, is, there's going to be a polling. We're going to ask your, for your input, um, and we'll explain that in a second. But if you guys could go and get ready for that um, polling uh, by going into the um, uh, following the link in the chat pod. And um, I guess you'll have to scroll up. There it is again. Shelly, Shelly keeps putting it in. But anyways, um, get ready for that. And there'll be a, f a few seconds when we get there. So today, um, Mr. Ostridge and I will be um, giving you the Federal Highway updates. Hey, Vishali, we're, we're going to ask for your input on the, we're still working on the name for the, uh, National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week. We want to change change, change the name. It's been, um, you know, I think the community has agreed that that's the best idea. And um, some public um, marketing and outreach people have made the same recommendation. So uh, after that, we'll have uh, Lieutenant Brady um, Robinette is going to talk about helmets and head protection for responders. I've seen his presentation, and it's eye-opening. Um, and then the um, somewhat famous Ron Moore is going to talk to us about uh, incidents involving electric vehicles. And John Farrell is going to talk to us about uh, ILOG, emergency alert system, another, another digital alert system. Uh, as you all know, it's part of our um, uh, Everyday Counts uh, Next Generation TIM initiative, the digital alerts for responder safety. I did want to let uh, the community know, if you don't already, if I haven't reached you already, or we haven't reached you already, um, we are uh, trying to organize a pool fund study for safety service patrol standardization and management practices. That's just the name we put on it, but basically what we're trying to get the community together. And this was at the request of several leaders in the safety service patrol community to do a, um, a pool fund study. 
So um, the the objectives will be to you know just come up with some technical reports and um, best practices, sharing of, sharing of best practices and um, uh, common issues, and, and maybe come up with some quote unquote standards. Um, you know, it's it's not money that your state has to write a check for. It's just a matter of if you if you're from a state DOT, that is, it's just reallocating. The state DOT just reallocates a, a small amount of money. Uh, and if you could go to our uh, the website, it gives you more information. There's a manual on it, and um, but you can figure out pretty quickly. And every state DOT research. Um, division or research office knows how to do this and how to participate in this. So we'd love your participation and um, and more to come on that. Um, yeah, if you just go to this website, uh, basically www.poolfundstudy.org, HTTPS. So, um, but you'll be able to, you, to find it once you go to that website there. And um, you, again, your research, the research at the state DOT uh, office will know how to do that. Uh, the self-assessment is coming again. Um, uh, just a reminder that it kicks off September 1st. It's going to be through late November. And uh, we're going to have a kickoff webinar on um, on September 1st at 2 p.m. And I'm sorry, I don't have the link or anything, so we didn't share it with you, but we will. We will certainly get that out uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the self-assessment this year is going to be um, uh, divided up into two um, basically two um, different self-assessments. One is for the, those that have been using, you know, partaking in the self-assessment, uh, will fill out the normal one that they, you know, usually fill out. But there's going to be a second version of the self-assessment for emerging programs, new new programs, and, and, and more rural communities, you know, rural communities and rural Committees that may want to fill out a self-assessment and not and not be dinged for some of the things like uh, service patrols, for example, that they they would normally um, you know not not um, not be able to control anyway. So, um, uh, na National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week. We're still calling it that at this point. We may not uh, for much longer, hopefully. Um, and uh, it will be on August 11th. It's an all-state call. Everyone's invited to join. Um, but we're going to talk about um, uh, mega training as part of the strategy for the Responder Week. And reminder, that week is in the second week in November every year. And then be sure to register for the Tim Quarterly newsletter, and we'll provide you with that information. But um, and that hopefully that will be coming out shortly. Um, so Vishali, I'm going to hand it over to you at this point. Is that correct? Yes, sir, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, just as a reminder, we have been at this for about two months in terms of looking for a new name for NTIRAW. And in the first round of feedback, we got a response from about a hundred plus. Tim professionals, including many of you on the call already today. 20% loved the name Traffic Incident Management Awareness Week. Uh, a fifth said we need to look further, and we got a lot of feedback from public affairs, uh, both within FHWA and outside of FHWA across uh, member associations to look for something that's more public friendly. And so this month, we want to present three total names for consideration, including Tim Awareness Week, and look specifically at how those names um, elicit interest, um, excitement, and ease of use. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. Milu? Um, and please do join menti.com, 4380-9448. Um, Neelu, may I please share my screen? Okay. <clears throat> so these are the two new names and the name that we tested last month. So we want to ask you about Crash Responder Awareness Week. That's the first name, Crash Responder Safety Week second name, and Tim Awareness Week, which we had introduced last month. So if you have your mentee up, um, we're going to go ahead and first ask you, oops, give me one second, a little finicky. We want to ask you, first of all, how memorable each of the following three names are. Um, and this is memorable from, you know, if you talk to your friends, if you talk to your colleagues that might not be Tim experts, if you talk to your family, which of the names do you think is going to be most memorable? Is it Crash Responder Awareness Week, 
Crash Responder Safety Week or Traffic Incident Management Awareness Week. So we'd love to get you guys to tell us which of these three names do you think when you're talking to coworkers, when you're talking to uh, executives, when you're talking to your neighbors down the street, which name do you think will be <clears throat> most memorable? So we have about 20 responses and we have about 120 people on this call today. And so what I'm hoping to do is get over 50, if we can, in the next 20 to 30 seconds. So I'm gonna see how fast you guys are putting in your numbers and seeing where we get. We're at 35 now, and that means we have about 15 more to go. How memorable are each of the names? So we're slowing down, but we can get to 40 maybe. Come on, guys, get your um, texting thumbs or your keyboard five fingers and, and uh, give us your feedback. So we're at 40. We're going to go to the next question. We have two more questions. Keep in mind this first one was on how memorable the names are. The second one is how exciting these names are. You know, when you're talking about it with, um, say, a news station or with a, you know, community association, which of these names solicit the greatest excitement? Is it Crash Responder Awareness Week? Is it Crash Responder Safety Week? Or is it Traffic Incident Management Awareness Week? Which one feels the most compelling, important, and exciting as you use it um, within your agency and outside of your agency. So we're at 29 responses. Let's see if we can beat our record of 40 from the last one. Looks like everything is neck and neck right now, you know, 0.1 or 0.2 off. So all of you guys that are highly opinionated, now I know some of you on this call have strong opinions. Please express those opinions through this poll. Uh, which of the names do you feel is the most exciting and compelling? All right, we are over 40, so we will go to the next one, and that is how easy is it to use in a conversation? So when you're <clears throat> talking to somebody, which of these do you think is going to be the easiest to use? And I clearly see the first person who responded just loves Tim Awareness Week, Traffic Incident Management Awareness Week. But if you're going to use it when you're standing, you know, on the side of the street or you're going for a walk and you're talking to your friend, which of these are going to be the easiest to use in a conversation? Hey, did you know this is Crash Responder Awareness Week? Hey, did you know this was Crash Responder Safety Week? Or hey, did you know this week is Traffic Incident Management Awareness Week? Which of these do you think would be the easiest to use in a conversation, um, not only in a technical audience, not when you're at TRB or at your TIM committee meeting, but when you're out there in the broader public because recognizing from our last call we talked about the fact that National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week is as much if not more about reaching out to the public and making them aware of the key importance of responder safety. It's, um, you know, getting to the broader audience. So we have 50 responses on this one. And so with that, I will relinquish my extra two minutes that I had out of five minutes, and I will turn it back to Paul. Uh, this has been really useful input. If you guys have other thoughts, please do um, add them in the chat pod. It looks like we're sort of neck and neck in, in terms of our response with Crash Responder Safety Week and Tim Awareness Week as being a little bit more um, preferred over the first one. Um, we hope by next talking to him to show the final, uh, debut the final new name. So thank you guys very much. And with that, back to you, Paul. Thanks, Deshali. Yeah, looks like we were pretty much neck and neck on those. No, no strong um, overarching uh, um, winner there. But, um, you know, just so you know, Jim and I have to, um, you know, we have to get the lawyers involved, make sure that it's a, an appropriate um uh, use of the name and that no one else is using it. And we do know there's some acronyms that, um, that someone mentioned in the chat pod, and, and we know we, we have to consider that, although I would like to not even refer to an uh, acronym, but that's my own personal opinion. So next up, Mr. Jim Osters, my partner in crime at Federal Highway. Jim? Thanks, Paul, and thank you, everyone. As usual, um, 
have to start out with this slide. Um, it's, it's horrendous. You know, we're just past the midpoint of 2021, folks, and uh, in insane, uh, the carnage out there. Um, a second, as you can see, a second safety service patrol uh, was added uh, to the uh, struck by uh, line of duty deaths uh, patroller down in Florida who two weeks after being struck uh, by a motorist while he was assisting a uh, commercial motor vehicle, he succumbed to his uh, injuries. So um, keep, keep him and his family and immediate and extended families um, in your thoughts and prayers, please. This is this is just insanity, and I, I hate, I hate having to cover this every time. But it's up to us to really um, figure out how we're going to stop this. The numbers um, are increasing. We had a nice jump this this uh, time around. You can see there at the bottom, almost 541,000 responders trained. Uh, but that first banner, I'm, I'm going to talk to you in a minute. Uh, on another slide when I show you the map. Uh, the uh, web-based training continues, whether at NHI and uh, Respondersafety.com, Responder Safety Learning Network. So please, please, please keep using your influence and, and push your, your communities, your, in your, you know, your jurisdiction, your responder disciplines to take this training. Um, there's still so much going on in our country, but Tim is a, is, a, is a big deal, and we got to get everybody working together to prevent these, these losses and, and injuries. Uh, through this slide in from the report, um, just to show you the increase above progress since last report, um, uh, in, in our quest or in our march to get to a, a million responders, and uh, of course, the table down below of you know the training goal of 45 percent, the number of states. Um, unfortunately, there's still three states that are under 15 percent. I won't put them on the spot, but you can uh, see for yourself in the map. Uh, they are trying. Uh, the map is coming up. That is, they are trying. Um, but anything that you can do maybe to reach out to uh, individuals in those states. And again, it isn't rocket science. You can figure it out. Uh, reach out to Paul, Joe, or myself. Um, but you guys are the leaders and the champions, and we need your help to uh, continue uh, training our national uh, uh, responder po population. Um, Next here, uh, last month we had four very successful train-to-trainer sessions. They were virtual. Um, some of you may have participated, but here you can see uh, the four classes uh, that occurred. And um, uh, we actually, on option three, you can see we, we even had a, a responder, uh, EMS, I believe, if I recall correctly, from Athens, Greece, that that attended the uh, East Coast session, and he uh, was very enthusiastic and cared deeply, and so that's pretty cool. Uh, a huge shout out um, um, on behalf of Federal Highways, by Paul, Joe, and myself, Katie, and our team, to these individuals, with which I think most of you are on this call, um, and uh, we can't thank you enough. For, for you volunteering to to conduct those cl classes and um, bringing additional responders into the realm of of traffic incident management and in in particular to train uh, because there are a lot of states that need to freshen their bench and so thank you to Patrick Rooney, Justin Gwynn, Gary McClellan, David McDonald, Jeff King, and Grady Carrick. Thank you so much. Next here, you see the number of, this is what I was referring to. Okay, I have to say this because it, it struck me, and it, it, strikes, it strikes me quite a bit, folks, that since the summer of 2012, we've trained, look at that number down at the bottom, over 13,000 trainers, 
instructors, folks that came to the Train the Trainer sessions, that graduated, and as you saw in the initial slide, there's 23% of that number is what has gotten us to that 541,000 responders trained. But think if, if half of this number or, or two-thirds of this number had engaged and trained, we, I, I dare say we'd be at the million or more. And it's and I, I'm sorry, you know I love you all dearly. We Paul, Joe, and I we we love you dearly, but you know, and it's not you per se. I'm just saying it's such a shame that that so many uh, uh, trainers, people graduated from this train to trainer and didn't train uh, a single person. Now there may be trainers out there that are training and never reported, as you've heard Paul and and myself say over the years. But if you know somebody. That, that has trained or, you know, know anybody that's graduated and, and isn't doing anything, you know, to train responders, even if it's an asylum, we ask you, I ask you, reach out, try to get, try to get them engaged. So I'll get off that. This map shows, as you can see, the top number, which is those trained in person and the number in parentheses web-based. This map shows the total train by state. And all these slides are in, in, in the uh, file, file uh, share. And of course, the goals map, going back to that other slide, uh, over you know, 25 states have reached or exceeded the 45%, which is phenomenal. Uh, but for some reason, there's a pause, and, and, and well, we, we know partially the reason, right? We won't get into it. Um, but Tim doesn't stop. We have to keep doing this, this job so that all of us get home, our families and friends. This is really a, 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 a national epidemic, uh, or as our friend Jack Sullivan said recently, you could call it a pandemic, the, the struck by situation. And, so please, I encourage you to do anything within your sphere of influence to get people trained and, and get fired up again. This slide here I added just to, um, as, a, as a little bonus today, for those of you that are new to, to Talking Tim, uh, these, these uh, uh, URLs, these, these resources, not only for the, the first two that I mentioned uh, for the online training at NHI, and uh, Responder Training Learning Network. But also I added our, our TIM web page, which is under develop, or not under development, it's, it's being refreshed. But nonetheless, a lot of resources there. And our great friends, uh, NILU and the National Operations Center of Excellence, just as a repeat, it's in the, it's in the file share, the, uh, the URL. There's a tremendous amount of resources at the National Operations Center of Excellence you can take advantage of. And this last URL, sorry, I grabbed it off, off our site. It's rather large. But these are the point of contacts for all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico. If any of you are interested in reaching out to a neighboring state to do a border-to-border a, a, uh, -border or regional training, Again, get fired up and do what you got to do to 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 train together. Once you're you're training in person, obviously, and and more as important as uh, leading a train the trainer session. Um, but whether in person or virtual, please keep doing what you're doing. These trainings, by the way, are free. There's no charge to the responder community. And lastly. Here's our contact info information. God bless and thank you for everything you do and keep doing great things. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Jim. I just want to reiterate that number of, of, of fatality struck by that Jim mentioned. Remember, we're, you know, we were at 40, was it Jim, 44 last year overall? 40, 46 last year. 46, but we're already at 35, so, um, you know, but, you know, it's just horrible. But one one thing that we you know we don't hear about 
um, as often. Sometimes we hear about it, but more often than not, at least at the national level, we don't hear about it, is responders struck by that, that leads to injuries and um, often life-changing injuries. So, um, you know, we, we are trying to get those numbers. We're trying to get some numbers. Um, but um, I think Lieutenant Brady Rob, Robinette has, has got a, a great idea, and I've seen his presentation, and it's, it's, a, it's a very compelling. So I won't. I'll stop talking, Lieutenant, and hand it over to you. Thank you, sir. You know, thank you, all. Thanks, everybody at Federal Highways and NOCO for allowing me to speak on this subject that I'm so passionate about. But definitely got a lot to cover uh, in a kind of a little amount of time. I will list some additional resources, so no doubt there will be some unanswered questions today. Just wanted to hit some of the highlights of, of this topic. But I, I titled this uh, presentation, What's Your Head Worth? And to me, that may be the most impactful statement that I make today. So think about that as I go through these slides and how that applies to your organization. All right, if I can get to the next slide. So kind of what started all this uh, uh, roadmap for me was our January 11th accident of last year. Uh, if you can look in the top right of that picture by the 55 mile an hour speed limit sign, the offending vehicle uh, that, that uh, you know, caused this havoc uh, on this scene. And I'll talk about uh, kind of these responders here on this slide. But there on the left, it's severely injured firefighter paramedic Matt Dawson in the middle there it killed. Uh, Lieutenant Paramedic Eric Hill, and not pictured is uh, Police Officer Nicholas Reyna. Uh, I was stationed with Eric for several years, got to see him a day and a half before the accident. Uh, you know, this accident shook my department, the community, uh, to our core, and I can't imagine the impact it's had on the families and friends of, of these responders. To talk about Matt just a little bit more, uh, he suffered injuries, broken bones all across his body. He's pictured there on the left before the accident in the center a couple months after the accident. They had his skull removed there so his brain could swell and not cause additional damage, but he had orbital facial fractures and a skull fracture. And uh, his overriding injury he's trying to recover from today is a traumatic brain injury, and he's on an extremely long road to recovery. And that's him on the right from about a month or two ago. So. Uh, good recovery so far, but still extremely long ways to go. So in the days and weeks after this accident, I decided I wanted to be part of change. And uh, what I wanted to focus on first was head protection. And so after talking to Jack Sullivan at the Emergency Responder Safety Institute, he suggested I write an article. And that's what I did. I spent a significant amount of time researching this. That article is available on, uh, on the website. Uh, of uh, fire engineering, you can look look for it, Google search it or whatever. But uh, what I really do in that article is make a call for a standard to be developed for a helmet specifically for roadway workers. And, and I hope we get there at some point. Uh, we're not there yet, so what can we do today? Well, we can select from a helmet that's currently on the market that best meets our needs and start wearing it today, tomorrow, and next year to protect our heads, to protect our most important organ in our body. And what my ultimate goal is, is that everybody on the roadway, whether that be fire, EMS, law enforcement, tow truck operators, DOT, construction crews, safety service patrols, that we're all wearing appropriate head protection to protect our head. Uh, emergency responder did a survey a while back. I think it's pretty telling of the dangers of the roadway. I think we all have a keen awareness of that. But uh, to summarize a couple of those statistics, 90% of the respondents, when asked the overall life safety hazard of a roadway incident compared to a structure fire, so 90% uh, said it's of equal to or greater dangerous, danger than a structure fire. And so 63%, to uh, further narrow that down, said they'd basically rather go into a burning building than a normal roadway incident call. So pretty crazy statistics. A lot of times you've asked law enforcement kind of the same deal. Would you rather go, go to a roadway incident call or a shots fired call? A lot of times, many times, they'll say they'd rather go to a shots fired call. And so I think that highlights the keen awareness and the keen danger of the roadway. I don't think right now across the nation we're doing a good job of protecting our heads, and, and that's what I'd like to see change. This picture was from Lubbock Fire prior to January 11th, but I just posed the question, are any of these heads sufficiently protected? And, and we got fire firefighters on scene, EMS, tow truck operators, law enforcement. So we got some uh, structural helmets on, a, a lot of chin straps up around the back of the helmet. 
Uh, got no helmets on, plenty of the responders out there, and a guy at the front has a different looking helmet. And so uh, to answer that question, I would say no, none of these heads are, are properly protected. I'll, I'll try to relate back to that uh, white helmet up front here in some of these future slides, though. But. So, and I think, you know, despite our best efforts uh, to protect ourselves from struck by accidents with blocking apparatus, you know, everything that Tim teaches us, those D-type drivers still seem to way, find a way to inflict harm upon us. And so I say, presumably, these issues are only going to get worse as roadways get more congested, drivers get more distracted, and new technologies such as autonomous and semi-autonomous vehicles present a whole new set of issues. Kind of a graphical representation of some of the helmets on the market today, by no means not all, all of them. The ones in red on the right are, are firefighter helmets, and ones in blue are just from other industry. But kind of my point with this graphic is, near every sport or industry has a specifically designed helmet to meet the unique needs of that wearer, you know, but we don't. Uh, on the right, uh, all those have uh, a standard backed by the National Fire Protection Association, Wildland Structural Firefighting, ARF, Search and Rescue, Swiftwater, but something firefighters do more often than any of that is respond to roadway incidents, but we don't have a helmet. Uh, and so, again, I hope to, hope to see that change. And most of all of these helmets have a standard behind them. Not only do they have a helmet, they have a standard. So uh, kind of think about some of these icons, those bubbles as you look at them. But, you know, think about, like, what if football players didn't have a specific use helmet and they had to wear a skateboarder's helmet? Obviously, that wouldn't be appropriate. You know, what if our military firefighters with the ballistic helmets had to wear one of these other helmets? That wouldn't be appropriate. But imagine these groups, one of these groups, any of these groups, not wearing a helmet at all. It, you know, it's kind of crazy to think about it that way, but even further, imagine the governing bodies that govern these sports or activities being okay with no helmet being worn. And, and that's really the, the, where we're at on, on roadway calls. Uh, governing bodies really don't give us guidance on whether we should or shouldn't wear a helmet. And so, you know, I hope to see that change. Uh, talking about helmets more specifically and how we can select one. So uh, motorcycle helmet standard would probably be, could be argued that it's uh, the most similar uh, to the type of roadway protect or head protection we need on the roadway. SNAIL is an organization that writes motorcycle helmet standards, and this is just kind of an excerpt. I'm not going to read each of those four on the right, but it's uh, the most critical elements that they define as uh, protective properties for the head. And so I'm going to talk about each of those four on these following slides briefly. So this crash dummy here kind of highlights uh, the different type of hazard that the roadway presents as opposed to the head protection like a hard hat or a structural helmet provides. Those protect us from top-down impacts. You can see that crash dummy's head impacts the side of that vehicle. So we need a different type of helmet. This little video right here is a cutaway of a structural helmet. I'm tapping some hard plastic right there to show you it's hard on the inside. Uh, I press down really hard on that, really good protection from the top of the head. With simple thumb pressure, I can bottom that helmet out. And in this case, that hard plastic is pushing up against the, the head, not the type of protection we need protecting our head. So here's a side-by-side -side of a structural helmet and a motorcycle helmet. So we don't want a webbing suspension system protecting ourselves from any type of crash type scenario. So we want foam protecting our head. Foam is the type of uh, technology that's in motorcycle, car racing, bicycling, snow sports, rock climbing, basically all those other helmets, they protect the wearer's head with foam. And so my point is webbing suspension system isn't good for crash protection, foam is. So this little video, I highlight the positional stability. It was a, another item that Snail talked about is really important. I built this test apparatus kind of to the same design criteria that helmet standards test helmets to for positional stability. You can see the first structural helmet came off. This is another structural helmet. It ripped the inside out of that helmet, but in essence, the, the helmet came off. Another type of structural helmet. It comes off also, and, and coming off is clearly a failure. So this is a European firefighter helmet. It stays on, rotates to a degree. Testing a hard hat here. I should have been wearing a helmet myself because this 
this buckle comes over and slaps me in the head. <laughs> Uh, this was a like a ninety dollar snow sports helmet that I just happened to have in my at my house. I tested it, stay zone, has a four point chin strap, really good positional stability. This is a search and rescue helmet that's uh, sold to fire service type people. It stays on the head, really good positional stability. And so uh, one of the next element Snell talked about was chin strap strength. So virtually every helmet standard in existence tests the chin strap strength. Why is that important to this conversation? Well, if we look at these two helmets right here, seemingly the similar helmet, but the one on the right has a breakaway chin strap, and it's that way by design. It, uh, that helmet standard that uh, specifies that is an industrial helmet standard. So the thought is if you're wearing an industrial application, the helmet gets snagged, it won't drag you into the piece of machinery, the chin strap would break, and the helmet would uh, continue on and you'd be able to get away. Uh, the white helmet that I mentioned in those earlier slides is the helmet uh, on the right, so it has a breakaway chin strap. So do not recommend a breakaway chin strap type helmet for a roadway helmet. Another element Snell mentioned is sufficient area of the head has to be covered. Helmets like structural helmets and hard hats sit high on the head and, and don't physically protect enough of the head. So when you're uh, selecting a helmet, think about that. How much of that skull is it protecting? Talking about European helmets, just for a second, I frequently get asked, are European helmets the answer to a roadway helmet? While they may be better than a structural helmet because they stay on the head via a more significant chin strap, they're not the answer. And the, and the reason why is because they still have a webbing suspension system in them, just like a structural helmet. This helmet in particular has a lot of internal projections that are mentioned in motorcycle helmet standards, which aren't allowed. And so those internal projections, when uh, hit on the outside of that helmet can push into your head and skull and cause additional damage. So what helmet should you select? Well, it's a super hard uh, decision to make and the reason why is because there's not currently a helmet standard. If there were, it would be a lot easier and so way smaller than you can probably read. I listed some criteria that I think is important for selecting a helmet. Uh, I have a resource that will uh, get you to that full list, but I listed three helmets there that kind of made my top three list when I was making the selection process. The helmet on the left, motorcycle helmet, off-road racing, substantial protection, but it's a really large helmet. As a firefighter, I probably still wouldn't be able to get into the cab of vehicle and render patient care. The helmet in the middle is a three-quarter shell motorcycle helmet, significant amount of helmet uh, foam inside that helmet, really good amount of protection, just doesn't have the chin bar. Uh, so it would definitely be good. Covers the ear, you couldn't hear good for situational awareness or as good. And then the helmet on the right is the helmet my department selected. It's that search and rescue helmet. And so it doesn't provide as much impact protection as those other two helmets, but it's a good helmet. It does have foam in it. I think it looks good and it's been uh, widely adopted by my departments. So to round this out, uh, second to the last slide here, so additional resources. My fire engineering articles out there, like I mentioned, you can search for that, find it. The Emergency Responder Safety Institute has a really good learning module, and inside it is uh, additional resources. It has all those criteria that I listed on that previous slide you can look at. That survey that I mentioned uh, previously in the slide, it's also on their website. And then there was also a short interview on there that, that I did a while back that kind of helped summarize this if you're wanting to send this to somebody else uh, to help them start learning about roadway helmets. And then my, my final slide is, um, so if you're in an administrative position, please consider buying a suitable roadway helmet uh, to protect your members, your personnel. If you're a boots on the ground type person, try to talk your administration into buying a roadway helmet. If they can't or won't for some reason, for less than $200, any of those helmets that I uh, had in my, like my top three pick there can be purchased. And I think that's a a small insurance policy for the amount of protection it's going to provide of protecting that most important organ in your body. But the, I challenge everybody today to take some kind of action on this before it gets up under the huge mound of work on, that I know everybody has on their desk. Uh, send me an email. I welcome you to. I'll answer all your questions. I'll present to your organization if you'd like me to. Uh, do an do a internet search on some of these helmets, bookmark some, take take some action today to just hopefully start this process of change at your organization or department. And I'll fin finally finish this out with what I started with, and it's the question is, what is your head worth? So thank you all. That's all I had.
Thank you, Lieutenant. That, um, it certainly is a compelling argument, and I agree. I, I guess I would challenge everyone uh, to add an, ad uh, an additional challenge to everyone. How do we go to the next level? How do we get there? Um, you know, this. You know, I, I don't. I don't know if, if you can look at those pictures of the Lieutenant's colleague and and not feel the pain um, that 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 gentleman, his family, his extended family, the fire. Uh, his friends uh, go through. So, uh, how do we get? How do we get there? Uh, maybe we need to brainstorm with a, a selected group and, and figure it out. So, um, thank you, Lieutenant. Really appreciate the information. So, our next speaker is a, and at least to me, anyways, is, is a very special guest. Um, uh, for, and I'm going to spend a minute introducing Ron. Um, sorry, Ron. Uh, but okay. Ron, um, there's a lot of credentials that Ron comes with. But for me. A lot of you don't, may not be aware that um, you know the National Responder Training is in part um, based on training that was um, developed for the um, Council of Governments in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and um, that was in large part developed by Ron Moore, if not wholly developed by Ron Moore. Uh, Ron Moore also was uh, at the very early stages in the development team of the Re National Responder Training, the SHOP 2 training, when it was called SHOP 2, uh, and has remained a active and is one of the, um, you know, been one of the master trainers and one of the best trainers in the country on Tim. So, um, you know, he certainly comes with other credentials, but uh, you know, as far as the Tim, he was he's been a very important piece of the National Responder Training all along. Uh, he's had trained hundreds of responders and um, um, trainers in the National Responder Training. So with that, that's enough said. Um, Brian, if you could take it from here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I wanted to do a um, little overview for the people online about traffic incident management challenges that I see exist currently or are coming related to electric vehicles and also related to autonomous vehicles, EVs and AVs. Uh, at the bottom of this screen is my email. If there's follow-up, rmore at fastmail.us will get right to me if there's something I can help you with in the future. What I see as a traffic incident responder and also as a traffic incident management person is um, two challenges from the electric vehicle. Um, an, an EV involved in a crash and an EV involved in a fire. We'll talk about how that's going to be challenging to us. And then also the autonomous vehicle involved in a crash as well. <clears throat> this is not a program about Tesla, although when people talk about electric vehicles, EVs, Tesla is the, the lead dog. Uh, they actually started in 2008 with a small vehicle. 2012, this vehicle came out, which is called their Model S, S is in Sam. But here's the key, whether it's, um, whether it's the Leaf, the Nissan Leaf, whether it's a Chevrolet Volt, a Chevrolet Bolt, B-O-L-T, whether it's a Tesla Model X or Model Y, it doesn't matter. They're using a new chemistry, lithium ion. The high voltage battery uses a new, essentially more powerful chemistry, lithium ion. If you look at the graphic on the right, you'll see um, the orange colored area represents where do you put a, a lithium ion high voltage battery on a four door sedan. On almost all electric vehicles that are produced or planned to be produced, they're floor pan mounted. This slide, this is what design engineers many times refer to as the roller skate. The rear axle is upper left. That center between the two uh, tires is the, the motor. This is a 1,000 pound, 400 volt, high voltage battery in this container, in this what I call a foot locker, the battery pack. It's floor pan mounted. The body of the Tesla Model S is put on top of this. So this particular unit, if you took the lid off this this can, there'd be over 8,000 um, individual rechargeable batteries, slightly uh, this larger than but com comparable to a AA battery, flashlight battery. So 
Tesla just recently had what they called their battery day, and they're coming up with a new battery chemistry that may change this a little bit. But in many of the incidents we're going to look at, responders talk about the crash physically damaged the battery box, and they found these small battery cells uh, scattered throughout the scene. The upper right, the orangish vehicle, is a brand new Chevrolet Bolt, B-O-L-T. Look at this artist's rendering. You can see where the floor pan mounted battery is. On the left in the, in the blue is what will be the Ford F-150 Lightning. It will be their electric pickup truck. But again, it's floor pan mounted lithium ion, almost going from axle to axle on these vehicles. This is what we're up against, regardless of the make, Regardless of the model, we're, we're dealing with lithium ion and pretty much floor pan mounted. Okay, so how does that affect us for traffic incident management? This is an incident investigated by the National Transportation Safety Board that occurred in Florida back in 2016. A Tesla four-door sedan occupied by one person went under, impacted and went underneath a tractor trailer truck trailer that was crossing the road in front of it. It went under the truck at 74 miles an hour. Now, it sheared off the roof, killed the driver, went down the road, almost a football field, yada, yada, struck a pole, broke it, went another 50 foot. But the, the difference here is when it's a, an electric vehicle, this was a Tesla Model S, when the damage is high and the floor pan mounted battery physically is not struck or physically damaged, we have a routine crash situation with one exception that is a huge exception for towing and recovery. NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, has forever offered interim guidance. There's three documents. If you're tow and recovery, your tow operators have to understand that this document, tow and, and recovery operators and vehicle storage facilities, is free. It's at the NHTSA website if you just do a search for interim guidance and it is critical. There's a second one for the owners of these vehicles, and there's a third one for fire, for law enforcement, for EMS, and for, um, for re rescue extrication personnel. The, the bottom line on towing, if it's an electric vehicle, it cannot be towed away from the crash scene with its wheels still spinning, with its drive wheels spinning, because that's one of the methods that electric vehicles have to recharge the batteries. So, so law enforcement, if it's your duty to request a, a, a tow truck to come to a crash scene in your district, make sure you talk, talk to your communications personnel and say this is a, this is a hybrid, this is a, a, a plug-in hybrid type vehicle, uh, this is a, a, an electric vehicle, a, a Tesla or whatever, and that way the word gets to the tow operator so they make sure they bring either a, a light duty with a dolly or a vehicle like this with a rollback. You have to get this vehicle wheels, drive wheels, off the ground as it's being towed away. Now, I borrowed this from um, Dan Spies in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is an incident that they had back in March. This was uh, a Tesla vehicle, so it's an electric vehicle. But again, the focus is not just on Tesla. But Dan tells this story. He got called to this incident. The driver was injured, hauled away in the ambulance, and when the driver with the key fob still in their pocket, when the car lost contact with that remote key fob, the, <laughs> the, the vehicle automatically locked all the doors. The windows were already up. The tow operator on scene that's getting ready to tow this vehicle reported that there was still what he described as noises coming from the driveline. Dan talks about the car still wanted to, to move. It still wanted to go away. There's nobody in it. It's locked up. The tow operator disconnected the 12 volt battery, but on this particular EV, on this particular make and model of Tesla, which is a Tesla Model Y, there is no exterior badging, exterior markers other than the corporate te Tesla logo T at the front and the Tesla corporate logo T at the rear. Other than that, he, what they didn't realize is on this particular Tesla, there is a, an entire second step that needs to be done to physically power this vehicle down, to make, it, to make it dead in the water, to shut it down. I like what one note here, and I'll mention a couple other case studies. Dan had to consult with online instructions. There are emergency response guides, ERGs, for all of these hybrid 
plug-in hybrids and electric vehicle. <clears throat> Several of the responders of cases that I'm going to talk about actually consulted online um, resources. So that's one thing we want to encourage. Now I'll go to Lower Marion Township, Pennsylvania, which again is, is this one is a suburb of um, city of Philadelphia. Kind of a brand new electric vehicle. Once again, a Tesla, but that's not the point. Uh, catches on fire while being driven. The, the uh, uh, Gladwin Fire Department and a couple others respond to the car fire. It turns out to be this Tesla. Look at the quote from the Gladwin Fire Department's um, press release. Two supply lines were laid and firefighters used two hand, line, hand lines. Now when a firefighter says we laid a line, we connected to, we physically connected to a fire hydrant. You can't do that out on the interstate and you won't be able to do that on, on a rural road. And we used copious, meaning flooding, a, a huge amounts, copious amounts of water were poured on the car fire on this vehicle for over two hours. That's what's going to happen. Law enforcement, the, the fire officer in charge of, at a burning electric vehicle may turn to the law enforcement officer in charge and say, I'm sorry, sir, this is a electric vehicle. We don't have enough water to continue to douse this, keep the fire under control or put the fire out. So we're going to have to go defensive. Essentially, we're going to have to let this vehicle burn up. Where What used to be a 20-minute um, car fire scenario, traffic management-wise, 20 minutes, 30 minutes were done, could now be hours. Look at this one in uh, Texas, suburb of uh, uh, Spring, Texas, suburb of Houston. I talked to the firefighters and read their reports, four hours of, of off and on fighting this fire. And if you if you calculate out what they said they applied from hydrants that were in this neighborhood, 23,000 gallons of water were used to put out this fire. Now, I want to show you this particular one because it, it is uh, the best example of how weird uh, these fires are. This is a, a Tesla that crashed through a guy's front yard, crashed into his garage, traveling 82 miles per hour. Now, in the video that that is produced by um, Lake Forest, California Fire Department, that you can see the burning vehicle in the guy's garage um, caused the, the garage to partially collapse, caused the structure to catch on fire. So the firefighters had a structure fire, but they also had this burning EV in the garage. At some point in time, they were able to get the house fire knocked down enough that they were able to physically pull that tow that uh, Tesla out of the, the garage, out onto the driveway. Then their heavy rescue had to come in and, and brace up some of the structure. Now look at the smoke in the background. That is from the, the Tesla that has been pulled out into the driveway. This is 45 minutes after the fire, the burning Tesla fire was extinguished. That is not right. There's something not right about smoke emanating from that. It's off-gassing. That's what all the authorities talk about. Thermal runaway, the stranded energy in the battery has caused thermal runaway. The cells are burning, and one cell, just like dominoes, will, it will burn or will ignite the next one. And, and on, on the Tesla vehicles, there are uh, vent ports. It happens to be on the driver's side and on the passenger side. Look at that fire. There is no way a firefighter today can say that's a normal fire, but that will be our new normal. That is the blowtorch effect of a, a lithium ion battery involved in thermal runaway underneath, in that pan, in that compartment, underneath this Tesla blowtorching. And the ironic part of this for tow and recovery, when they finally went to tow this vehicle, they, they, they put water underneath it for several hours and, and finally cooled it down. The tow truck guy is going to tow it away. When they went to tow it away, it caught on fire again, partially while being loaded on the tow truck. This is an incident from Mountain View, California. This is literally right down the road from the Fremont, California, from Tesla's headquarters. This car ran into that, that concrete barrier. It ran through the gore.
The fire department put the fire out twice at the scene, called factory representatives, battery engineers to come out. They, they did what they could do. They put a couple of the battery cells in that blue bucket. And then, get this, the fire department decided it was so volatile, it's so prone to reigniting, an engine escorted the tow truck 21 miles, 42 mile round trip, 21 miles to Atlas Towing. When they dropped the Model X, this, this vehicle off at the tow yard, it caught on fire twice in the tow yard and reignited six days later. NTSB did a report on this vehicle and found um, three weeks later when NTSB investigators got to the car, it still had stranded energy. It still had electrical current in the battery. I need you to get this report. You need to go on, on a search engine and get NTSB forward slash SR dash 20 forward slash 01. It is a NTSB safety report. It truly is an outstanding document. It's totally free to download, and it summarizes the safety risks to emergency responders related to lithium ion in electric vehicles, exactly what we've been talking about. It has details of the investigation from uh, Lake Forest, California with the garage. It has details of the investigation from um, the Mountain View, California on, on uh, the, the interstate crash. We haven't adopted this policy yet in the United States, but if you had a Tesla, if you had an electric vehicle, this is a Tesla, that catches on fire in the country of Belgium, they will bring out a giant roll-off dumpster fill it with water, bring a crane or a heavy wrecker, and essentially dunk your, electric, your burnt electric vehicle in this water for 24 hours. <laughs> I, I, I'm used to car fires 20 minutes, we're back in quarters, and I'm talking here 24 hours to, submer to, to totally submerge uh, this vehicle. My final couple slides talks about autonomous vehicles. They also, uh, th this is an emerging field. Uh, autonomous vehicles, the upper left is the Cadillac, uh, the lower, uh, the one on the right slightly lower, the orange van, is something we had in Arlington, Texas. I could be in Arlington, Texas out by the ballpark, by the football stadium. I could punch in that I needed a ride to a local restaurant, and this van would show up with no driver in it. I open, the side door opens up, I get in the back, and it's a robo-taxi or a shuttle. It takes me where I need to go. So we're going to see a, a plethora of autonomous vehicles uh, come out in, as passenger vehicles, as robo-taxis, passenger shuttles, um, delivery vehicles, FedEx, uh, Amazon, and the like, as well as we have 18-wheelers, Waymo, which is owned by Google. Uh, they're looking into driverless 18-wheelers hauling freight, uh, as well as truck platooning. So what's supposed to happen with autonomous vehicles is the one vehicle, the one you see on the left, is supposed to use whatever sensors are provided, cameras, LIDAR, radar, sonar, whatever is available provided by the manufacturer to sense its surroundings. But what we're finding that is traffic management related is the sensor systems don't always detect things that are stopped or, or stationary in front of the vehicle when the vehicle is at highway speed. So my case study also was investigated by the National Transportation Safety Board. This is Engine 42 from Culver City, California. They are in a block to the left blocking the HOV lane and partially the hard shoulder on I-405. Now, 405 is six general traffic lanes in each direction plus an HOV lane in each direction, plus the hard shoulder. Off to the right, you don't see it in this picture, there's a motorcycle accident that has occurred, and they're treating the injured uh, driver of the motorcycle. At that point, uh, an autonomous vehicle with a human driver in the driver's seat crashes into the back of engine 42. So there's our struck by. Fortunately, nobody was injured, not even the occupant of the, of the electric vehicle that was on a, in an autopilot mode. But, uh, and none of the responders were injured. But what if engine 42 had not been blocking uh, the, the HOV lane? So the NTSB did, uh, included this report. They came up with a word that I love. They came up with the term automation complacency. 
And what they found is that, that because, for example, Tesla promotes this system as autopilot, essentially hands off, which Tesla does everything they can to make sure that they, they explain you have to be there, you have to put your hands on the wheel. But the, the automation complacency makes the average person think they could literally get, get the car to drive and get, in, get in, in the seat and sleep the rest of the way. And that's what happened here. The, the Tesla actually crashed into the back of engine 42 because the NTSB said the automate, advanced driver assistance system, the, the autonomous vehicle, allowed the driver to disengage from the driving test. So Paul mentioned the, the SHARP-2 program um, and, and the training. Ever since we started that, we, we've had the original Ds, drunk, drug, drowsy, distracted, and, and I stick with dumb. So in, in SHARP-2, if you're a trainer um, and, and you get to that slide, it should be uh, up front in your program. You're talking about the Ds. It's, tra it's traffic incident management against the Ds. I'm proposing we add a new D, drunk, drug, drowsy, distracted, dumb, and driverless just because we've, we're already having cases where autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, are crashing into stopped uh, vehicles, uh, people, uh, uh, traffic cones, driving over flares and the like. So uh, it's just a proposal that is something we should consider, if you're, uh, particularly if you're doing some traffic incident management training. Paul, that's my uh, presentation. Thank you. Well, tremendous, tremendous information as usual. I, I agree with you in so many points. One is the dumb. Um, I, I, I got over, over vetoed at, at, um, <laughs> within the team on using that term. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll consider that. I, I dare say that Jim would, um, would, would probably agree with that, a, a, additional D as we're upgrading, uh, updating the, the training. Um, you know, another thing that I can't help thinking about is these problems are not going to go away, right? They're going to get, you know, more and more, right? With the push for, we're going to see more electric cars. Um, there's going to be electric charging stations in the next transportation bill. So, um, you know, we, we need to get a handle on this um, as a nation. And, uh, again, another, I guess that's another another um, research effort that we, we probably should take a look at Um and uh, Jim and I will, and Joe Tebow will, will take a look at that. Um, so our next um, speaker is John Farrell. Um, and again, another um, another um, way that we can use technology to improve safety of responders and motorists. And um, that's about all I know about the help alert. So I'll be quiet and hand it off to John. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So nobody really needs to know about the system in advance, and it's funny you say that because that's actually kind of the point of it. So the way this started is a few years back, um, our team was presented with a challenge. And the question became, how do you contact travelers during an emergency or a major incident on a road, but they don't have your mobile app, meaning the state's mobile app like a 501 or something like that. They don't subscribe for email or text alerts. They don't know about the, the 501 website. They don't know to call it. And then the other trick is that the DOT and responders want to get information from the travelers, not just send them updates. Well, help is the answer that we came up with. It's a two-way emergency communication system. Um, and kind of like I was referencing, it's not really intended for everyday traffic jams, meant for major closures, especially the ones where you're going to have cars stuck on your road for several hours or more. Now, I can tell you all about this system, um, but I really want you to learn about it by actually interacting with it. So to participate in today's demonstration for this, pretend that you just received an emergency alert on your phone, um, like the one in the picture. And that's one of those wireless emergency alerts that I'm guessing this group knows pretty well uh, for things like amber alerts and severe storms and things like that. Well, imagine you have one and it says that, you know, the road you're sitting on is closed and it says go to and then it gives you a link in the website. Now, that website there has an active pretend emergency on it that you can uh, type in. Now, I'm going to keep moving my slides along, but if you look at the footer of this, uh, the slides, you'll see that website there. So please feel free to take a look, and welcome to our pretend emergency. So help itself is pretty innovative, and partly it's because travelers don't need to know about the system in advance. Um, you don't have to do press releases. You don't have to let people know. Because when an event is happening, the system is activated in the person's vicinity, it's going to use those wireless emergency alerts um, that is going to allow you to notify people that, hey, you can opt into this. 
So the emergency alert goes out to a geofenced area, and then you're, the person's going to be able to click on that link and then register to get updates through regular text messages from the DOT or Turnpike or whoever's managing that incident. So you'll be able to send the official word from the agency about what's going on down to folks as you're warning them at the same time. And people that are stuck can actually give you information back, if they're stopped, of course, and tell you about their situation. The idea is that this is really going to come together to enhance the effectiveness of the response to this incident. So overall, what we're talking about here, and we're going to take a look at the system itself in a minute, is a three-step process. The first step is to draw the area of concern. This is the geofence of the area where you want to send the warning. Now, like I said, that can be where you're trying to tell people who are already in a trapped queue what's going on. It could also be to send an alert to warn people that there's stop traffic ahead. It all depends on the policy of the state and how they want to implement it, but it's really just drawing a geofence around that roadway and that incident. Then comes the alert part, and that's where we've integrated the system with FEMA's wireless emergency alerts. So what it's going to do is it's going to get that WIA down to that geotargeted area, and if they're stopped, it'll give them instructions for how they can opt in to get updates via regular text messages. Finally, it's the communication portion, and that's where you can send text messages out to folks, whether you're doing health and safety checks, you're just updating on a situation, whatever it is, um, and get information back. So the system's been in use, and um, we have five states that are either actively using it or in the process of deploying it right now. Um, I know Todd Lease is on the call, and he was one of the very first uh, folks that we worked with on this system. Um, and actually, today's demonstration event was inspired by something that happened on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And that example is the most common type of the two use cases we have for the system. And that use case is when we have a two-way communications need because of a highway track use situation. Now, what kind of uh, causes for this closure of trap queue? It can be just about anything you can think of. Uh, these can be storms. Winter storms in particular are pretty nasty, and that's what, what started the one that uh, Todd unfortunately had to deal with a few years ago. Um, snow and ice basically always make logistics of clearing crashes more difficult, as you all know. Um, and you can also get a lot of secondary crashes in this situation like that. Of course, other weather problems do too, whether it's dust, smoke from wildfires, uh, we even had a situation in one state where dangerous fumes from a, a chemical warehouse fire caused a shutdown of the interstate. Um, so there's lots of things. Uh, we also have it when law enforcement needs to shut down a road. You know, we've seen in some cases um, police chases that have happened. We also know that, unfortunately, fatal investigations can shut things down for a long time. Um, you know, we've seen now with wrong-way wrong -way driver crashes and things like that. Uh, we actually had an, an activation about a week ago um, where a truck hit a bridge and actually moved the bridge six feet. And this was an overpass across an interstate. So of course, they had to demolish the bridge, and they had the road shut down for something like three days. Um, during that system, they were sending out these emergency alerts to notify people to avoid that area, and when they first had it stopped, to communicate with the folks that were there. The point that I want you to understand here is versatility. It doesn't matter why there's a crash on your roadway or a closure of your roadway. In any of these cases, you're going to be able to send out this, this emergency alert, communicate with folks, give them updates, and receive information back from them. Now, the picture you see on the screen right now, that's actually a screenshot from the real activation in Pennsylvania. And all of those dots that you see on the screen, those are all vehicles, well, cell phones, I guess, more accurately, that have opted in to receive updates. So every time a pin goes on that map, that's another person that's opted in because you can share your location and then the DOT is actually going to be able to sit at a central location, and they're going to be able to see the trap queue um, painted, literally, in front of their eyes along the way. Now, the other type of use case that we've seen this for um, is for one-way alerting. And this is what I alluded to earlier when I said you want to send out a warning message to a group, but you don't necessarily have a trap queue involved. And the one really good example, well, okay, there's a few good examples, but the one that I want to point out here is another one that uh, Todd Lease was unfortunately involved in. Sorry, Todd. Um, the turnpike unfortunately found a crack in the bridge that connects the Pennsylvania and New Jersey turnpikes um, during a routine inspection at one point. And they had to warn motorists for a very long distance. And in fact, if you see the image here, that is the actual shape file uh, that was drawn, which goes back somewhere between 50 and 60 miles up the roadway to warn people, to say, avoid the area if you can, but if not, 
be prepared for some dangerous stopping conditions because they knew that the roadways that were people were diverting onto from the bridges were not prepared to handle the traffic of the entire Pennsylvania Turnpike uh, at that point. So this is a really good way to warn people about things. Um, you can also use it if you're evacuating something like a hurricane and, and things are going, uh, all the roadways are turning contra flow. Um, or flooded roadways, or even if a roadway in another state is closed, you might want to let folks know at the last turnoff point. So those two use cases constitute um, the basics of the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over here for a moment, and I want you to kind of take a look at what the system looks like. So the page I have up right now, for those of you that haven't seen it yet and played with it, this is what you see when you first click on that link that's in the emergency alert. You're going to see a brief uh, picture, a description, more or less a title here, and that's going to be very similar to what was in the emergency alert. And then you might get a little more detail on the website here, and then you can register and opt in for alerts if you want. Now, if you register and opt in, you're going to wind up having a bunch of fields come up. And these are things that different agencies customize different ways. But this is basically a little information gathering about the people that are stuck on the roadway right now. All that information comes in and gets populated on a screen like this. I'm just refreshing it as more folks have joined the demonstration. And what we're going to see here on the map is on the top of the screen is kind of a spreadsheet looking area that has all of the phone numbers and the answers to the questions from folks that have opted in to receive updates. On the bottom half of the screen with the map, we're going to see our geofenced area, and we're going to see some of those pins coming in. Now, obviously, there's not a lot of people out there, so this is all simulated right now. But this is where I can see a particular uh, dot there. And again, a red dot indicating it's a truck or commercial vehicle. I can see what their phone number is. And I can look up here, and I can reference things. But the real power here, aside from that initial emergency alert, is that if I want to send an update or a message to everybody in this queue, there could be four people here, there could be 40,000, it wouldn't matter. I can select all participants, and I can send an update message to them from my console as a TMC operator or somebody like that. Click Send, and I've just blasted that message out to everybody that's in my trapped queue. The way I really like people thinking about this, and it was actually sent to me by a, a member of the DOT, they said, yeah, this is instead of our state troopers having to go around and knock on everybody's door or window to say, hey, how are you doing? Or, hey, here's the latest update. Um, you know, in many cases, that's not really practical or possible anyway. This is a way to get that out there to all these folks. You can also wind up seeing any messages that people text back in. So if you see on my screen right now, I've got kind of two things in two colors. The greenish R, yellowish one, is messages that the TOC has sent out. And then the ones in orange, or, or salmon, I guess, are ones that have actually been sent by the public back to the system. So you actually can see things going in both directions. So what this tool really does is it's going to open things up for you in terms of giving you the ability to reach out and alert folks in the area that you're concerned about, whether that's for stop traffic ahead or in the case where folks are already stopped on your roads and you want to communicate with them and calm them down or give them updates or anything else you want to do. And it's then going to also help you get that information back to paint that picture of your queue and show you exactly what's happening on the roadway in terms of what the people on there are doing and experiencing and just generally who is there. So as I shift back to my slides, uh, this is the handful of states that are currently using the system, um, Pennsylvania being the longest running. Uh, they've had the most activations. And like I said, um, it was their, their incident that they had in the winter a few years ago that really inspired uh, the, the starting of this system. And uh, the rest have come on board since. So what I really want you to remember here, if you remember nothing else from uh, the few minutes I've gotten to talk to you today, is that there's really these three things that you're going to be able to do using a system like this. Um, you're going to start by drawing. So you're going to be able to define that geofenced area of concern. Um, you know, a lot of times we're going to say that's stuck to the roadway so that we're really focused on the people um, that are immediately impacted by this. Then you're going to get that alert out so that the emergency alert is going to hit those phones. Again, nobody knows to, needs to know about the system in advance who's on your road, which makes it perfect, whether you're a daily driver, you know, a commuter, a commercial trucker just passing through, you're visiting because you're a tourist, um, any of these reasons. You know, something like 99% of phones are going to get hit with this because they're, they're capable of FEMA's system. 
And then finally, you get that ability to communicate with the regular text messaging uh, for anybody that updates, uh, opts in for the updates. The idea is that by just working with these three steps, we're going to be able to help first alert people to the dangers that are there and the dangers of, you know, dealing with the incident uh, responders there, making sure that you are safe. And then the people that are, are stuck, help them calm down and get a little sense of security, knowing that the roadway agency that's managing it is aware of their situation and actively working to clear the roadway. Hopefully that helps make some people that are sitting on the road make some better decisions about their travel or how they should act if they're actually sitting there caught in a jam. So when we put this together, what we're really looking at is a mix of the emergency alerting system, the power of those we is to get the word out to folks, and then the power of the two-way communications to actually share that info um, with folks that they need to, to make their better decisions. So at this point, um, I'm going to wrap so that we make sure we leave some time for Q&A here. Um, my email and phone number are on the screen here, and I'll leave that till Nilu decides uh, to, uh, to take back the screen control. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, answer anything. Thank you for your time today, everybody. I appreciate the invite. Thank you, John. Uh, nice presentation. That's good. Um, yeah, we, we are going to have um, a few minutes for questions here, it seems. First thing I want to comment is on Todd Lease. You know, he's a little annoying, don't you think? Everywhere I go, Jim and I go, we hear about Todd's doing this and Todd's doing that. He's one step ahead of everybody else. You know, when I say he's annoying, I'm just uh, joking, of course. But, you know, and then I see him in the chat going crazy in the chat. He's just such a great leader, Todd. I just felt that I need, I was compelled to give Todd a shout out because of all his leadership and all the cool things that he's doing over there in Pennsylvania and on the pike. Um, but, yeah, I can see why your wife would call you annoying. Yep, Todd. So uh, with that, I just wanted to mention before we get into Q&A, and, &A, and I, I, we do have some questions and I have some questions. Um, so next month's Talking Tim is we're going to go back to the Everyday Counts, Next Generation Tim, focusing on um, – um, local TIM programs is one aspect of the Everyday Counts initiative. So Patrick Chavez out uh, of Colorado, they have a cool program where they have 27 TIM teams across, across the state. And then we'll be talking about all these different ways that TIM, the TIM training has been institutionalized. That's where we want to go, right? We, we want to be institutionalized. Uh, the, the, well, yeah, we want to be institutionalized, all right? The, the training needs to be institutionalized um, in, in order for it really to stick. And we're seeing that throughout the country. We want to talk a little bit about that. So that that is next month. Uh, again, Talking Tim is the fourth Wednesday of every month. So with, with that, um, we do have some questions in the chat. If someone could help me find them. Um, uh, one is, uh, oh, Bob, um, Todd answered um, Bob Murphy's, um, uh, friend Bob Murphy from Florida's question. And, um, but I, I had a question um, for the lieutenant. You know, how, how do we go to the next level with the, with the, the helmets, in your opinion? It's just a matter of, uh, getting acceptance with the senior managers, the white hats, if you will, and, you know, and others. It's not just white hats. And that, that's just fire. But, you know, with all the other disciplines, um, I just, you know, I just something I, you know, compelled to ask is what, what, what can get us to the next level, you think, with, with the helmets? Yes. Yeah, so I think, I think that's an excellent question, and it's the obvious question, and, and maybe the hardest question of how do we get to that next level of really mass adoption. What I like to look at, to me, is the relative success of the high visibility vest. You know, uh, how, however long that came out ago, maybe 10 years or whatever, you know, the idea came about. It got mandated, you know, at the federal level, at, at all the levels it is, and then adoption is fairly high in, in a relatively short amount of time. And so I would like to see that the roadway helmet get adopted at the same, at the same level and level of adoption, and hopefully even higher than the high visibility vest. But to get there, I think we really need a standard to be developed. And, uh, you know, I think the missing piece of the puzzle is uh, unbiased entity picking that up and saying, we're going to spend the time in the lab, the due diligence, to see the likely hazards ahead would likely receive, and we're going to write a, a standard to, uh, 
you know, protect those workers from, from those injuries. And so uh, that's the missing piece of the puzzle and probably funding is the biggest barrier with that right now. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lieutenant. Yeah, that was a whole process with the with the high visibility vest, and, um, and th there were some people that were on on that on that committee um, that you know or, or that group that, that pushed it and, and provided the standard, and, and so maybe we can we can look into that. Um, question for Ron. Ron, the um, um, you know the other materials that cannot be used, only water can be used to put out those um, lithium battery fires? Um, so Paul, there's, yeah, there's two sides of that situation for, for the National Fire Protection Association did lab studies at the University of Maryland where they actually burned uh, the older style nickel metal hydride high voltage batteries and they burned the new style lithium ion. They were the ones that came up with copious the, the statement copious amounts of water because it it needs cooling. So all of the case studies that I referenced in my presentation, the firefighters had difficulty cooling and they, they wound up trying foam, they wound up trying dry chemical or dry powder, but they also found that it was the water that being applied that was what finally did the trick. The real issue is the individual batteries that are called cells, whether they're in a pouch like an envelope or whether they're a battery like Tesla uses, they're inside of a metal foot locker. And they're not, it's not easy to get the water physically onto the cells that are burning. So what they found is the water copious, flooding amounts, copious amounts of water, it has a, a cooling effect. So if somebody could come up with a, a, another agent that would cool, um, that would might knock down the fire for that moment, but it's it's taking away the heat to stop the domino effect, the thermal runaway effect that is a real issue. So that's why out in the interstate and in a rural situation, we're not going to have 20,000 gallons of, of water available, and that's why traffic management is going to be an extended operation when it's a electric vehicle fire. Yeah, that, yeah that's crazy, and all the issues that come with it. I'm, Really appreciate you bringing this to our attention. I, you know, I, I don't think we can bring out dumpsters like they're doing in Europe and and cooling the vehicle off for uh, you know it, you know for for 24 hours, given the amount of electric vehicles that are that are going to be um, going to be out there. Um, I'll hey, tell I, you another just, thing, another thing, ahead. Paul, that I forgot to mention uh, in that um, incident where the Tesla crashed into the garage when they when the rollback the the, the tow truck rollback went to pick it up the battery pack was exposed and and drooped, drooped. so they actually used uh, used wood underneath to insulate the damaged battery from the metal decking of the tow truck now I know in my area here in, in, in Dallas area tow trucks don't come to the scene with a sheet of plywood but literally we may have to investigate or explore insulating decks metal decks of tow trucks to prevent them from being contacted by crash damage or fire damage batteries as well. So that's another, that's another aspect that tow and recovery needs to get involved in. Yeah, Jim, Joe, and I were texting off to the side, and um, we, we, we think this, this is a research project that might, may, you know, we, you know, we're going to try to try to get some attention on. Um, um, thank you for bringing it to our attention. I didn't never really <laughs> realized how much um, you know the, the implications of it w were that extensive. So um. yeah, it's cutting edge, hey, Paul. Paul. What you mentioned is true. There's many manufacturers, as well as even states here in the United States, that will say after a certain cutoff date, say 2030 or 2035, they're not going to allow the sale of internal combustion engines. There's manufacturers right now, like Volkswagen, they're saying after a certain year, we're going to stop producing internal combustion engines. So I think we are at, at the cutting edge. We are taking a look in, into the, 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 the future uh, for us for traffic management, and now would be the time to kind of get a handle on it. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. If that was you, Jim, I was about to call yeah. you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, more, more questions for Ron. So. What about environmental uh, issues, Ron? The, 
in the National Fire Protection burn test that they did under laboratory conditions, what they found out, Jim, was that the burning of the vehicle and, and or burning of the lithium ion battery created no more hazards than a normal fire would, would involve. So that means that we're still going to use protective clothing. We're still going to stay uphill, upwind. We're going to use the self-contained breathing apparatus. But they found that the runoff uh, pollutants or debris was nothing more than would have been uh, involved if it were an ordinary combustible vehicle. So leave that to, to, for what it's worth. Um, the problem is stranded energy. The, the juice that stays in the battery afterwards, uh, General Motors had a a crash test where the vehicle that was crashed spontaneously ignited three weeks to the day, three weeks after it had been involved in the laboratory crash test. So the real problem is the, the stranded energy that stays inside. But what comes out is, not, is literally not, not anything worse than what we're used to already. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Ron. And as far as um, you mentioned the, you know, historically, you know, the lead acid batteries that we've been using for decades. But uh, what about these gel batteries? Is, is the lithium ion um, uh, contain gel, or is it a is it a battery? Um, I guess similar to the gel batteries that you can buy for your cars now, or is that is that something uh, else? Yeah. The, 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 U, the U.S. Department of Transportation has classified the high-voltage batteries as dry cell batteries. So, okay. so the, the battery guts of it is dry. However, lithium-ion batteries, because of the voltages and amperages involved, need to have coolant. So the coolant can be yeah. a liquid, similar to antifreeze, or the coolant can be air. Manufacturers do it both ways. So you may actually find a liquid leaking out from a crash-damaged uh, lithium-ion battery, which may be nothing more than glycol antifreeze solution. Um, but the batteries, fortunately for us at this point, are classified as dry cells. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, you know, lithium-ion is what most of us go to, uh, or at least I do, for, for my tools, hand tools and 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 what not because just the the longevity you know of the charge that lithium ion uh offers versus uh the other so anyway um thanks thanks for being here ron this is awesome and uh of course you're you're awesome as well <laughs> Thank you, Jim. The other thing that's, a, that's an issue, um, many of these vehicles, if you have a special charger at your home, your, your battery of your vehicle can supply power to electrical power to your home. So now what they call vehicle to home power backfeeding is going to be an issue for firefighters as well. We may, we may shut off the power uh, at the pole for a house fire and find that the house is still fully energized. It may be coming from the guy's electric vehicle that's plugged in uh, in his driveway or in his garage. So that's a, another issue. Yeah, it's not traffic management, but it's another EV type issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I see some of the comments in here. We um, certainly agree that more more training, more information needs to be shared with the TOAs and the Safety Service Patrol, and police officers, and of course fire. So more to come on this, and I think we, you know, given the way the future is going with connected and automated vehicles, we need to focus on this. And actually, we had been thinking about a research topic or some funding that could be available, and we certainly we just put our hat in the ring, so to speak, and we may not get the funding. But this is an area where I think, uh, given the, the future, we warrants uh, attention, um, and we'll see if we can get some. So with that, we're at the top of the hour. Thanks to all our speakers, um, you know, for you know for joining us today and for the information. This was a great webinar, great discussion. Um, um, we really, really appreciate it, and um, hope you guys can you can all join us next month. Um, more to come and more interesting topics. So um, we will um, talk to you all soon. So thanks again and. Uh, be safe out there.